guy is a touchdown machine for the Houston Cougars. Sasser again, just kind of taking over right now. That's NBA stuff right there. He is a baller. Stick it in your pipe and smoke it, baby. Yes! Welcome to the Scott Holland Podcast. It's here. We finally arrived almost eight full months without Cougar football in our lives. We have arrived at game week, that wonderful time of the year when the football season beckons with fresh hope and a future not yet blemished by any unsatisfactory on-field results, and excluding teams that played in week zero. Uh, sorry, Nebraska fans. You're never going to find, I would say, just across the sport, a more hopeful time for all of college football fandom. And we brought in a repeat friend of the show, plus a new voice to give us the skinny on that week one opponent, the UTSA Roadrunners, uh, in addition to our thoughts about the Cougs week one opponent and matchup. And of course, we have lots of Houston Cougar sports happenings outside of the gridiron to talk about multiple fall sports now underway. Dustin, my friend and co-host for low these many, many episodes over the years. You got to love the start of college football season, don't you? It is. It's, it's you're in this kind of just tantalizing time where you haven't got to see Cougar football just yet. Um, but we got a little taste of college football with the week zero slate and then just, uh, you know, not to jump way ahead to the very end of the episode here, but not only just the Cougar game on Saturday, but just the uh, wide array of uh, fun college football games that are taking place on Saturday as the season uh, kicks off uh, for real, for real. Is, uh, it's a, an exciting time to, to uh, be a, a college football fan, exciting time to be a Cougar fan, even if, uh, man, it still feels like we've been waiting for a long time and don't yet have uh, an actual game to talk about, but we're, uh, or at least a, a game that has happened yet, but. Uh, an actual game to preview this week, so very, very uh, good times. This is your weekly reminder. From yours truly, we here at Scott Holland Podcast are proud members of the 1012 Network, a network for all things Big 12 Conference Athletics, including your future Big 12 Houston Cougars. We would absolutely love it if you follow them on Twitter, at TEN12Network, and of course, listen to the 1012 Podcast wherever you put podcasts in your ears on the internet. And of course, you know what I'm going to talk about next, Home Field Apparel, Home Field Apparel, Dot com, our good friends, one of our absolute favorite companies and brands on planet Earth, makers of incredibly comfortable, incredibly unique collegiate vintage apparel. If you are listening to the podcast, there's a pretty good chance I would say you're a Houston Cougar fan who would just uh, absolutely love their collection of t-shirts, including wonderful Sailor Cougar designs from their recent Houston Cougar collection refresh. But no matter your team of choice, you the listener, you can get 15% off using the promo code Holman12, H O L. MAN12, 15% off your first quarter of absolutely gorgeous premium vintage collegian apparel. And I would also mention the good folks at Homefield have launched hundreds of schools over the years from the biggest brand names to non division one schools, but top to bottom, an absolutely unmatched collection. No lack of quality for the little guys, which I think is one of the really cool things about Homefield. So that's homefieldapparel.com, promo code Holman12. The season's almost here, folks. So what, what better way to celebrate than? refreshing your Houston Cougar collection than buying some sweet, sweet home field apparel merch. Dustin, obviously football is the topic on all of our minds, but as I mentioned at the top, we got a couple of Cougar fall sports and I would say good vibes from uh, both of those Cougar sports. Why don't we start with uh, Cougar volleyball tonight? Yeah, Cougar volleyball opened their season uh, this past week with a 2 and one week at the LSU Tiger Classic in Baton Rouge. And it was, you know, I think it, it's nice that we're sitting here talking about uh, a pretty optimistic opening week for Cougar Volleyball because it didn't necessarily start that way. Uh, the Cougs uh, got swept by Rice, dropping a competitive first set, 25-22, uh, before dropping sets 2-3, and 25-18, and 25-18, in noticeably less competitive fashion. And, you know, kind of like we said last week, Sam, Rice is a top 25 level team, so there's no shame in losing to them. But, you know, it's an early season test of where the Cougs are at, and you know, at least based on this one result where they're at is not at the level that, you know, maybe you'd have kind of hoped for them to be at if you were being uh, super optimistic heading into the season. Definitely a bit of an auspicious start for the Cougs against Rice. And we knew Rice coming in would be the toughest opponent uh, in Baton Rouge, certainly. And arguably, I would say the second toughest opponent of the whole non-conference schedule. You said the first set was fairly close, but UH just couldn't get over the hump there and ultimately lost the uh, subsequent two sets pretty decisively. And you don't want to ever fully try to explain a result in any team sport, volleyball included, on one individual's performance. But I think the fact that your top offensive threat, Abby Jackson, only had a 13.5% hitting percentage of this game, certainly below her usual standard. And 
as your, you know, high volume, really effective offensive threat goes, you know, so goes your team. I will point out Isabel Toy had a sterling 12 kills and a 47.6% hit percentage. Kellen Morin had four kills in her Cougar debut, but yeah, it was, it was a rocky start, a rocky start against a good opponent, an opponent who certainly isn't going to be in any reality, a bad loss in your schedule. But I think we were probably hoping for at least a three, one, three, two loss and kind of a tough start, which thankfully, uh, did not bode uh, ominously for the uh, subsequent two games in Baton Rouge. Yeah, I was going to say, the kind of negative vibes continued for a little bit after that, because even after the opening loss, you know, and you know you wanted to finish the weekend strong, for a moment there, it looked like that wasn't going to happen because the Cougs faced LSU, uh, the host Tigers, and dropped the first set 25-18 and then trailed early in the second set. But then just a really remarkable way to finish the set, uh, finish the match, I should say, by Houston. They rallied to, you know, narrowly take that second set 25-23. In set three, LSU scored the first four points and then Houston closed the set on a 25-8 run, which is a pretty good way to uh, to take a set if you can do it. And then in set four, not wanting to go to that kind of up in the air set five, uh, tied at two. Houston wanted to finish it uh, strong. LSU actually led 22-19 in this one before Abby Jackson just absolutely took this match over. Here are the last six points of that match from LSU having a three-point lead. Uh, Abby Jackson block, Abby Jackson kill, Abby Jackson kill, service ace by Sanaa Dotson of Houston, Abby Jackson kill, Abby Jackson kill. Uh, and that was it. The match was over. Um, and, you know, like we talked about uh, last week, you know, LSU might not be an NCAA tournament team this year, but a true road win against a decent SEC team, uh, not a bad thing to have on your resume after uh, one week of play, Sam. And I mean, if you want to contrast this with last season, the Cougars went to another SEC program's uh, early season non-conference event last year. They went to the Bama Bash last year to see Alabama team. We're actually going to see this coming weekend. And I would go further. Bama wasn't just a you know, middle of the road SEC team like I think LSU. Will be. Bama was bad. Bama won two SEC matches all of last season. And I think beat the Cougars three to one in Tuscaloosa last year. It, it was, you know, certainly one of those of many. I would say, you know, in a twenty five seven season, losses that kind of you know prevented the Cougars from ever having a serious at large kind of resume. And to get this win, and you know, you don't want to compare single data points to single data points too much, especially this early in the season. But I'm just going to point out that Rice needed the full five sets. A very good Rice team needed the full five to beat LSU on Saturday evening, whereas the Cougars were able to take in four. Does it mean a whole lot? Eh, I'm not sure, but I don't think this LSU team's a pushover and that the Cougars coming off a tough result in the, uh, in the opening game earlier that day, that was their second game of Friday to do what they did. I thought really impressive. Abby Jackson, obviously a star with 19 kills, but want to point out, Andy Cook had a double-double, super impressive, 41 assists and 10 digs in four sets. Isabel Toit had another good game, had 13 kills of her own just behind Jackson. And just a good, and again, that at that first set loss, it almost felt kind of like an inflection point. I saw that first set loss and was just like, oh no, we're not going to get swept two games in a row because as much as you don't want to go crazy after the first weekend, I think we'd have a decidedly different tone about this team you know, if, if you went one and two with just the win over Sanford first, being able to get that Friday night win over the uh, homestanding Tigers, I think that really just changes the feeling and changes the narrative out of this first weekend. Yeah, so uh, the Cougs, as you mentioned, uh, Sam took care of business on Saturday against Samford, sweeping the Bulldogs to finish the weekend 2-1, and one, despite a very uh, tight competitive first set there. The Cougs able to get the sweep. Um, and then uh, Houston will be back at home for their home openers uh, this coming week as they host the Flo Hyman Collegiate Cup. Uh, Houston hosting Central Arkansas and Alabama on Friday, and then Oregon State on Saturday. And really, this is a, a weekend that Houston needs to rack up the wins. Uh, Central Arkansas, bad team, should be an easy win. Uh, Alabama, Sam mentioned it. They, uh, you know, this matchup gives Houston a chance to avenge a bad loss from last year when they lost 3-1 and one to uh, a Crimson Tide team that would end up going 10-20 and 20 on the year. And then uh, Oregon State can do one worse than that 10-20 and 20 record. They can actually do five worse. They went 5-25 and 25 last year. Uh, they lost their opening matches this year to Long Beach State and Portland State. So playing at home against three teams that were all miserably bad last year, uh, this should be a 3 nothing week for Houston. Anything worse than 2-1, and one, I'm hitting the panic button. Yes, UCA and Bama did go 3-0 and uh, both against iffy competition last weekend, but Sam, these are the matches you got to win. Yeah, with all respect to these three teams that you've just mentioned that are full of Division One caliber volleyball players, U of H should be 5-1 and one after the Flo Hyman Collegiate Cup this weekend. I think no ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, the only other volleyball thing I had, I just wanted to shout out uh, Kate Georgiatis, who is the AAC 
Defensive Player of the Week, I believe, coming out of this opening weekend, was fourth in the country in, uh, in digs per sets. And of course, as you can imagine, Abby Jackson was also named to the AAC's weekly honor roll as well. So a nice, nice statement first weekend, and I think a chance for the Cougs here to get what should be three easy wins and uh, come out of the first two weekends, five and one. All right, and as I mentioned up top, the fall sport vibes uh, are positive this week, not just because of volleyball, but also because soccer got its first one of the season, beating Sam Houston 2-1 to one up in Hunts Vegas. Uh, first win of the Jaime Frias era uh, comes on the road as Houston had a couple of uh, bookend goals right at the uh, end of the first half, beginning of the second half, and then after a 68th-minute reply from the Bearcats, the Cougs held on for that uh, 2-1 victory. So really nice to see Houston Sam get the dub to improve to 1-1-1. And, and also it's nice to see them, you know, winning in categories like shots, shots on goals, corner kicks, all the signs of, you know, winning the game because you outplayed the other team, which, you know, Houston probably should be doing uh, against teams like Sam Houston. Yeah, this was one where we expected the Cougars to dominate, to have a larger number of chances. And thankfully, that expectation actually bore itself out in real life. The Cougars, like you said, had a greater number of shots, shots on target, just chances generally. Uh, both of the Cougar goals came from first-time goal scorers this season. Maddie DiChiara broke the deadlock in the 42nd minute, and Janice Singleton doubled the Cougar lead just after the start of the second half with Caitlin Matthews assisting on both goals. I think what really impressed me, though, Dustin, just looking at the box score. So, you know, the Bearcats broke up that clean sheet uh, with a penalty by Kaylee Pena in the 68th minute. But I think what impressed me was when I looked at the play-by-play in this one, that was the Cats' last real offensive threat in this one. They only got one shot in the remaining 20-plus minutes of action and the Cougars were able to take that win uh, down 45 back to Houston. And just easy for, you know, you and you've had two matches prior to this one really not go your way. You know, it, we didn't see this team panic. We didn't see that penalty really give the Bearcats a meaningful lifeline in this game. And I think I'm not going to go too crazy over a win that we both absolutely expected that anyone should have expected this team. But, you know, I think the hope is there that this group returns to Houston. They go into their first home match, which we're going to talk about here in a second with maybe a bit more confidence just to finally see yourself win a match. You know, that that kind of mental hurdle can be tough to clear. And I think this team can at least go back to Houston and now start playing some home games with a little confidence under their belt. Yeah, you mentioned Houston uh, finally having its home opener on Thursday when they host Baylor. And then the Cougs uh, have another home game coming up against Rice on Sunday evening. And I think these are two really big X-Factor games for the Cougs on the schedule. Games that feel like they could really go either way. Uh, 2-0, and 0-2, and both feeling very comfortably on the table this weekend. And I think either of those you know, would materially change how I feel about the state of this year's team, even though it is still very early in the season. Um, but I said that because both Baylor and Rice, like Houston, were you know, comfortably in the top 100 last year, but weren't, you know, NCAA postseason level good. Um, and it's Houston's first time facing the Bears in over a decade, while it's their fourth straight year facing the Owls. And the home team has won the last three of those matchups. Rice is uh, one and three this year with home losses to Samford and Loyola of Maryland. So feeling pretty good about keeping that streak going for hopefully exactly one more year. But yeah, I don't know, Sam, just feels like uh, this could be a, a pretty big, you know, turn fork in the road for uh, the Cougar soccer program with a couple of, uh, either way type of games this uh, this coming weekend at home. And I agree with you. I think 2-0 and and 0-2 and is definitely on the table with both these games. This is a Baylor team coming in on Thursday in their first season under head coach Michelle Lennard. She'd previously been a long time, pretty successful head coach at Dallas Baptist. You know, According to their website, there are 15 new players on this roster. So you're going to see two teams on Thursday you know, figuring stuff out under new coaching staffs. You know, I don't know if I'm ready to feel super super confident yet about this specific cougar soccer team but i'm excited to see what this team looks like in a game that actually counts on their home field and baylor obviously isn't anything close to a gimme but they're also not an unbeatable opponent either and i think it would be a wonderful anecdote to that frustrating result uh at lamar a couple weekends ago to see the cougars beat a future big 12 conference mate and rice is an interesting one and over the years the owls have certainly been the better of the two houston area soccer programs but it's been nice to see in the last couple seasons, these two teams face off with both of them being varying degrees of reasonably good soccer team. The Cougars might be catching the uh, Owls on the downswing. Actually, when these teams met last time at the Carlos Lewis International Complex, it was the spring season and the Cougars beat the Owls 2-0. And that ended up being a Rice team that went fairly deep in the spring NCAA uh, tournament in 2021. Uh, you know, not a pushover opponent like Baylor, but also pretty winnable if the Cougars can take their performance to a different level at home, you know, you have two good chances this coming week to really change the narrative around the 2020 Cougar soccer season. You're not going to eliminate that 3 nothing loss at Lamar, but 
you go 2-0 and here and it feels different. It feels like maybe you've turned a corner there. All right. So, Sam, we've talked about the two in-season Cougar sports. So we're going to talk next, talk next about the third Cougar sport that is going to kick off its season, which is, of course, Cougar Cross Country opening their season this week on Friday. They'll be in Lake Charles for the McNeese opener uh the Cougs with you know some veteran uh returnees uh both on both the men's and women's side uh, for cross country on the men's side you got super senior Devin Vallejo Bannister as well as uh regular senior Brandon Seagraves uh on the women's side you know da- gone is Darby Gaunt but your second third fourth and fifth highest finishing athletes from AAC championships last year do return uh led by sophomore Aaron Rivera and senior Claire Meyer so Sam this is You know, entering year two of the Ray Stanfield era at Houston, still a program that is decidedly in the bottom half of the American. But, you know, we'll see if maybe they can uh, make some strides this year with, uh, like I said, some veterans on the roster. Yeah, I'll be interested to see, especially guys like Vallejo Bannister and Seagrees who've been in the program a while to see see how they develop and see if they can help you get that next step from, you know, kind of bottom half ish, middle of the pack AAC program to you know one potentially maybe in the top three or four on the men's side. All right. Uh, so we are, of course, going to go ahead and talk some Cougar football now. The main meat of our episode is going to be previewing the UTSA game on Saturday. But before we get to that UTSA game, do want to talk a little bit of uh, big picture program stuff. And that is the Cougars uh, in the past week have uh, made a couple of additions to the program. A high schooler uh, commitment, Jamal Shaw, and then a uh, transfer, Sam, in uh, Jalen Garth. Yeah, and that first edition came from Shaw on Friday afternoon, uh, committed to the Cougars at a pep rally before his team, uh, West Orange Starks, uh, season opening game. Uh, Shaw's a three, high three-star recruit, chose U of H over finalist Baylor and UTSA and held offers from some big names like Oregon, Mizzou, TCU, Texas Tech, and a number of others. It had been rumored for a bit that Shaw was strongly leaned U of H. A couple of guys on the recruiting beat at 247 gave crystal ball predictions for Shaw to ultimately commit to the Cougars, but still nice to ultimately see U of H get another player who really fits the profile of guys who've done quite well in this program. And, you know, even acknowledging the imprecision of recruiting rankings, I wanted to note that with this 2023 class right now, it has a higher average 247 composite rating than that Ballyhooed 2016 recruiting class uh, that featured at Oliver. And that higher average rating without the outlier of a five-star, I feel like is pretty significant. You know, recruiting rankings don't ever tell you anything super useful until after the fact, but seeing that U of H is getting a bump from the future move to the big 12. That's good. You would hope to see that in the situation with an upgrade in conference affiliation coming. And it's not a coincidence that the three AAC programs with the highest composite happen to be the three programs depart for the big 12. And Shaw is just another piece in what's been, I think a real promising 2023 class so far. As we said before, and it's, you, you can't just look at one player's, you know, 24-7 24-7 composite rating or stars or however that is and and conclusively determine what that player is going to do. That's not that uh, it's not nearly that simple. Um, but at the same time, you're not going to consistently win at the Big 12 or any you know high level of football by consistently bringing in, you know, lowly recruited guys without many other offers who are, you know, lowly rated recruits. It's just you, you can hit on those individually, but that's not how you build a program. Uh, in the long term is you have to get some of the guys that are the highly rated guys because there is a pretty strong correlation there. It's not a perfect correlation, but there is certainly a a correlation between guys being highly tied recruits and guys, you know, turning into successful uh, collegiate players. So good to see, like you mentioned, the Cougs uh, getting that uh, notable uh, Big 12 boost. And the Cougs uh, stayed with the Golden Triangle, though did go to the portal this time. Jalen Garth uh, joined the Cougars after two years in the Texas Longhorn program is originally from Port Neches Grove, like I referenced, in the Golden Triangle, was a four-star national top 250 recruit uh, out of high school, ended up playing in two games with Longhorns last season after missing his true freshman season 2020 entirely with an injury. I uh, was obviously recruited by the Tom Herman staff, and even though he stuck it out for last season and most of this current offseason with that program, I think the fact that they've just brought in just a absurd number of five-star offensive linemen so some might say their nil operation played a big part in that and that the sarkeesian staff is very clearly recruiting over him and i think garth probably saw the writing on the wall there and decamped to a program where he'll still have a chance to play high level football but probably won't be stuck behind seven or eight five stars or whatever that program decided to bring this offseason and i think because of how late this happened i don't think he'll be eligible for this season but I think once 2023 rolls around, Garth will be somebody playing a fair amount. Certainly somebody, I think, uh, in the picture of Patrick Paul has a monster year, and this one ends up being his last year in Scarlet and Albino. 
Yeah, it's always good to get uh, you know highly touted offensive line recruits, and and we've seen Houston have some success with bringing in guys that were just you know stud recruits that went to to programs where there were just a couple too many other stud recruits in front of them. With you know Tank Jenkins coming in, Tyler Johnson coming in from uh, Austin this past season, and now adding Garth as well. And it's you know it's that, that, that's how quite often you end up getting guys that you know their high school you know recruiting profile puts them a little bit out of your league, um, but when you can get those you know bounce back guys as uh, as transfers, you certainly. You know, take someone who has a uh, high, high level of uh, high, high ceiling that he can grow into uh, as a recruit. And certainly, uh, I think Garth uh, fits that bill. No doubt. And we've delayed it long enough. It's time to talk about the thing that's been on everyone's mind. Cougar football, week one, the UTSA Roadrunners. And we brought on a couple of friends of ours to uh, get the lowdown on the team just west of us on I-10. All right, we are very excited to be joined on the Scott and Holman podcast by Jared and Adrian from the Alamo Dome Audible podcast. Uh, guys that we've enjoyed gleaning our UTSA information from over the years, excited to have them on previewing actual honest-to-goodness uh, Cougar football coming up here on Saturday. Uh, Jared and Adrian, uh, appreciate you guys uh, taking some time out to uh, chat with us today. I've been looking forward to it for years, so it's great to be here. You guys are, are in many ways, a model of what we try to do. At absolutely, Alamo. absolutely for sure. Uh, that's, that's very kind of y'all to say. Appreciate that, uh, and very flattering. We, we appreciate what you guys are doing out there uh, covering the Roadrunners. Um, and yeah, to jump into uh, this matchup, um, you know, UTSA obviously one of the stories of college football last year, starting the season eleven and zero, being ranked as high as number fifteen in the AP poll. And while the season ended with a conference USA championship, the Roadrunners bookended that win with some multi-score losses to UNT and San Diego State, and fell out of the polls. So I would say, you know, just how much, if at all, do you think the two late losses and the intervening off season you know, have they at all slowed down UTSA's program momentum and or and or overall fan excitement from that you know eleven and zero top fifteen level? I wouldn't say slow down, right? I, you know, people are saying the ticket sales for this week are, are underwhelming. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it did. Maybe it did have a little bit more effect than I thought. I guess, I guess we'll see what actually happens on, on game day. But I mean, the team the team recruited super well <laughs> all the, through the off season. So I don't think the recruits were uh, were too disappointed by it. But uh, yeah, I mean, compared to the expectations going into the season, I, they certainly far far exceeded uh, anything that anyone could have reasonably expected. So I I think the fan base is pretty fired up overall, and um, I'm expecting a pretty good showing from the fan base on Saturday and the team uh, to that effect as well. Yeah, for sure. A lot of the talent that departed, we we were able to reload at. Right, so a lot of those voids got filled. And yeah, I, I think there's a reason for a lot of Roadrunner fans to be uh, optimistic about those positions that we may have lost at, graduated at. So Jeff Trailer mentioned today, Monday, during his media availability, how much he's hoping for a big crowd, big home field advantage on Saturday at the Alamo Dome. Jared, you kind of started mentioning it uh, just a moment ago. What are your gentlemen's crowd forecast for Saturday, and what do you think – is the biggest animating factor for the UTSA fan base heading into this one? Is it facing, you know, an in-state team from a, you know, league you're about to go into? Is it, you know, wanting to relive the the 2014 game, which <laughs> quite honestly, a, a nice contrast of extremely high point, extremely low point for the two fan bases uh, in this game, or just, I think, a general hunger for football season that we all have after, you know, a really awesome season for the Roadrunners last year. Man, loaded question off the bat. Uh, I think it's going to be a nice, like, 35 to 37K, you know, really, really strong crowd for UTSA. I mean, I think that would probably be top six, top seven all time in in program history, right? And also, Um, a half-empty Alamo Dome is still extremely deafening to sit inside and play on the field on, yeah. Yeah, they had uh, four high school games in the Alamo Dome last weekend. And in some of the clips, uh, you know, the recruits posted from those videos, I mean, there were, you know, five to 10,000 people. And holy crap, it's not as crazy loud <laughs> on video. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a pretty rocking atmosphere, even if, you know, maybe it's not going to be the sellout that maybe people uh, perhaps uh, naively were hoping for. Well, that it should um, be. It should be one. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That, that, The one, the sellout that it should be. But, yeah. Sure. I think I think San Antonio, just as a city, like it, it needs to get a little bit stretched out and warmed up, right? And so I think it's just hard to get all those, even after winning a championship, you know, it's just hard to get everybody super excited to get out to that first game. It shouldn't be, but I guarantee uh, by the time week five and week six rolls around and the Roadrunners have strung together a couple of wins, yeah, people are going to be excited to get back in that stadium and fill it up. But 35, 37, I'll be in agree- agreement with you, Jared, uh, which is still a great crowd for UTSA, absolutely, and a loud one. 
But to answer the other part of your tra- uh, question, um, Trailer also mentioned in that same round table this morning, hey, we have a chance to come in here and play this U of H team and get ourselves right back on the map. And I think he summed it up perfectly right there. You talk about those two games that, that we dropped off at the end of the season, and I don't think that did a whole lot as far as disengaging the program or disengaging a lot of fans, but I bet it did disengage a heck of a lot of just casual watchers across the country that were maybe paying attention to UTSA. Well, here's the opportunity for UTSA to get right back into that conversation at the office. You guys see the Roadrunners in some random state flyover, right? And and that's that that's absolutely right. It's, it's our opportunity to get back on the map, back to that relevant conversation. When you talk about AP polls as high as 15, which is still mind-blowing to me, but yeah, yeah, it's the, it's the opportunity to get back into the relevance conversation of the top of the G5. All right, we're asking you guys some tough questions right at the top, uh, bringing up late last year's losses and making you uh, make crowd predictions. But get into the uh, the meat and potatoes of it. Actually, talk about this year's on the field uh, UTSA football team. Um, you know, really tantalizing offensively. After that was, you know, I think their better side of the ball. It's safe to say. Last year, getting Frank Harris back at quarterback, getting four offensive line starters back, most of Harris's, uh, pretty much all the top receiving targets back. You know, but the one big loss is, of course, the running back sincere McCormick. Uh, kind of the heart and soul of the offense. So what's kind of the offensive prognosis having so much returning depth all around, but missing kind of uh, the one star in the middle of it all? Yeah, I, I think the guy that people are missing out on, I, I think missing the left tackle, Spencer Buford, is going to hurt the offense more mm-hmm. than the running back, Sincere McCormick. Uh, he's going to start for the 49ers as as a rookie, uh, almost at a freshman. That's so embarrassing. I'm, I'm so <laughs> not an NFL guy. <laughs> uh, but Buford was the first four-star uh, recruit to UTSA and you know four year starter he was an absolute monster mm-hmm. uh, that left tackle position is supposedly going until game day I mean you, you know how those things go but right now on the depth chart it's a three way or between uh, a 19 year old Juco sophomore um, a junior that's been in the program for a while kind of been a rotational piece uh, and then a true freshman that played private school football last year so that is very much up in the air now for the running back position, I've never been super, super, super concerned about McCormick moving on, and that's not to diminish anything that he brought to the program because he's a very special player, generational talent. Uh, I just realized today he was just a couple yards away from having 4,000 yards throughout his career at UTSA, and that might not ever happen again. You know, it'll definitely be a long time. Um, but I think you're going to see more of a running back by committee. Um, obviously, getting Traylon Smith to transfer from Arkansas to UTSA was a massive mm-hmm. coup. For Jeff Trailer UTSA, I think he's going to have a big impact this week and, and throughout the rest of the season. Um, and then Brendan Brady decided to take his super senior gear as well, uh, set the spring out, so hopefully his legs will be a little bit fresh. The running back position is a pretty good spot, but I think if the offensive line struggles a little bit without Buford, it might give the impression that the running back room is taking a step back. But mm-hmm. I think they're going to be competitive enough and, and talented enough that position to you know uh, compete with most of the teams on this roster or on yeah. the schedule. Excuse me. And as far as the rest of the offensive line, we we do have a lot of returning talent, right? So maybe yeah. that maybe that left tackle position is a little bit thin, but the rest of the rest of the offensive line is girthy, experienced, and ready to rock. So I, I think our running game is gonna be okay, sort of hanging a hat on that, and, and still be able to have plenty of production. And I want to zoom in on one guy in this offense, super senior Frank Harris. He returns at quarterback, and I think it's been really interesting to watch him progress over his career. He got real. Uh, significantly better from 2019 in the 2020 season when he was the starter, when healthy, then had another big jump uh, going into last season. Uh, Do you see him taking another big step forward? And what is Frank Harris's ceiling in 2022 in your guys' estimation? Man, you talk about the heart and the soul of the offense being sincere McCormick. I'd I'd say you're wrong. The heart and soul of the offense last season was Frank Harris, man. And and this season, really what what is going to be is that He's going to have so much more opportunity than he's ever had before. I mean, you're going to see Frank drop back and throw the ball more than we've ever seen him do it. And so I think that's really where his ceiling is. You know, he's, he's going to have all the opportunity in the world to put out insane production, right? The, the, the leash is going to be off that guy this season. And so, yeah, I, I, it's, it's very scary for opponents to, to prepare for because the dude could do it all. Yeah, I think what you're going to see from Frank is is just a more spread out offense than we saw from UTSA last year. Uh, they had two really, really, really strong tight ends last year and ran a lot of 12 personnel. 
Uh, Leroy Watson is the tight end that I was referring to. He's now playing left tackle for the Falcons, made the move from, from tight end to, to tackle at the professional level. Uh, so I think we're going to see UTSA import, employ more of a traditional spread offense. Um, new offensive quarter, Will Stein, is from Lake Travis. And, I mean, you guys have probably seen Lake Travis playing some state championships. They love to sling the ball around the yard. Uh, so I think the offense is going to shift. You know, UTSA doesn't really have a whole lot of, you know, inline block heavy tight ends on the roster right now. Uh, so I think Frank is going to get a lot more opportunities to, you know, throw the ball five plays in a row, you know, than last year. It's like you kind of feel the need to give the ball to Sincere because he's such a great player. Um, so I think that we're going to see a little bit more pass happy even offense from UTSA and, and just spread the ball around a little bit more. All right, then getting to the other side of the ball, UTSA got some impressive production up front last year. They held opponents under three and a half yards per carry, registered 33 team sacks. Clarence Hicks responsible for 10 and a half of those sacks, more than twice as many as any other single player. He's no longer around. Uh, do you see that UTSA defensive front being able to withstand his loss with kind of making him, making him up in the aggregate to borrow, borrow the other money ball line? That's a key question for sure. And yeah. I, I can't imagine any one player replacing Hicks sack total directly right i think there's an argument made that as a whole the defense can kind of match that by bringing pressure from different angles and having different guys involved in the pass rush and all of that um but it's just such a relief for a defense to have that one guy in the field that you know can win a one-on-one matchup with anybody right mm. i don't know if utc has that player on the roster right now they got a lot of pieces that i like you know for pass rushing uh but i think that's probably one of the biggest questions on the defensive side of the ball is can they consistently get to the quarterback and make them speed up their progressions right um, as far as stopping the run, I think they're in pretty good shape. Uh, they got a transfer from LSU, Joe Evans. He's 6'3", 340. He's actually going to play at the defensive tackle position and the three-down technique. Uh, so that's pretty impressive to have a 340-pounder out there that can run fast enough to get to the sideline. <laughs> I can't wait to see how that one plays out. You know, I, I hope the reports are true that he really is that fast, but it's definitely a unique look. Um, but I think overall you're going to see a lot of cool like packages and combinations from this UTSA defense. They do have a lot of depth. Uh, there might not be as many like no names on the roster, but it seems like they're going to have kind of like platoons, you know, third and long. They're going to bring a whole new defense out and stuff like that. So that's something that I'm really interested in watching from a schematic standpoint heading into Saturday. One of the few numbers that I think stands out on the stat sheet as a negative from UTSA is really remarkable 2021 season was the 8.3 yards per pass attempt al- allowed uh, to opponents over 14 yards per pass completion. in The secondary does lose an NFL draft pick in Tariq Wolin, who I've been seeing your guys tweeting and retweeting. It seems to be doing a really uh, bang up job in camp with the Seattle Seahawks. So how worried are you about the roadrunner secondary going up against one of the stronger QB wide receiver combos in the country and Clayton Tune and Tank Dell and a Cougar team that won't be shy to throw the ball on Saturday? I would say I'm pretty worried. Right? Um, yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's kind of ironic because I think the secondary could be a heck of a lot better than last year, but mm-hmm. I don't think the pass rush is going to be as good. So I think in a lot of ways, the secondary might look worse, even though they are better. And I, I mean, like you said, you know, I, I think Tune and, and Dell can, can really take advantage of that. Uh, biggest issue for the secondary last year wasn't necessarily speed, size, anything like that. It was communication, right? There were mm-hmm. so many lapses in coverage. You know, receivers just running uncovered down the field on a streak pattern and they're wide open for six points, right? So UTSA is bringing in all these like high profile recruits. They got a four star that they flipped from Kentucky. Uh, they've got a TCU transfer in. They've got an LSU transfer in. I mean, the list goes on and on. But, you know, if they're not going to communicate like the last group was, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter how fast they run, how big they are, what power five offers they got. Right. So that to me is the biggest point of concern for this entire team. Right. Is, is can the defense kind of prevent those like really deep uh, passes? Right. Because UTSA will play a lot of man coverage you know one high zero high type stuff right so it's really critical that you know they're not letting receivers run free wide open uh, because they don't have clarence hicks coming around the corner to make the quarterback get rid of the ball in two seconds like they did last year right yeah we're gonna kind of flip flop from the pass rush and secondary from last year to this year right maybe so it'll be interesting to see but that's going to be one of those one of those uh growing pains that we're going to have to get through i think for the first half of the season is figuring out the secondary all right, and uh, just want to you know close by saying uh, you know kind of get your general. What's the question we ask a lot of our guests on here, and that is, 
um, to just kind of the, uh, the the recipe for success. You know, UTSA 12-1 and at the Alamo Dome under Jeff Trailer, but Vegas sees them as a slight underdog on Saturday. So, you know, kind of what's the most important thing that has to happen? And what's the recipe for uh, the Roadrunners to start the season 1-0? and It's a good question. Well, one thing that Jared said on our podcast a lot, it's not on the field. It's actually in the stands. It says that UTSA fans need to be extremely loud. We actually saw Alamo Dome noise contribute um, to a couple of plays last season and, and ultimately got us some wins. Uh, but no, I, I think it's going to be up for the offense to be able to to keep up with y'all's, right? I mean, you talk about that tune dell connection and, and how lethal it can be. Well, Frank Harris is three receivers that he could pick from uh, that, that are all just – upstanding talents and so can can they go blow for blow with u of h i think that's what it's going to come down to i think this game is going to go super back and forth a lot of high flying offense and <laughs> a very very entertaining to watch but can, can does you does utsa have the, the horses to be able to do that for four quarters against a team that's better than any team that they played last season that's the question mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for me, it's going to come down to who can get the big turnover, right? I, I, I think UTSA's offense is going to be clicking pretty well from from week one, right? They've returned so much. Obviously, left tackle is a big question mark going against Sack Avenue, right? Like, oh. they're going to have a chance full, no doubt. Um, but I think both teams are going to score plenty, right? So it's like, which, which secondary is going to get that big turnover, that clutch interception, right? And UTSA has brought in the playmakers that have the ball skills to do it, but they don't have the experience playing with each other. And they're going against a veteran quarterback who knows how to exploit those kind of weaknesses in a secondary, right? So if UTSA can just click from day one in the secondary, uh, then I'm going to give them a chance to win for sure. But, uh, you know, right now, without having seen a lot of these guys on the field together, it gets me pretty apprehensive uh, having seen this uh, UH passing attack up close and personal. Mm-hmm. All right, so I know I said that was the last question. That was the last question we had, but we got the Alamodo um, Audible guys on. So I'm going to call an Audible because selfishly, I need you mm-hmm. guys to answer one more question. And I am driving into San Antonio for this game. So... Where, as someone who's been to San Antonio maybe half a dozen or so times in my life, where have I not eaten in San Antonio that I have to get a meal when I'm in town for this game? Mm. We're just moving from the uh, uh, informative interview section to Dustin uh, Dustin making his travel plans right now. Using <laughs> podcast time to openly <laughs> solicit We're travel plans. We're so used to it. No worries. Dude, I tell you, dude, if you haven't got some brisket from Lot C at the tailgate, dude, you need to come to the tailgate because there's because it's not it's not a place you can just drive to and pull up to it and get food from. But there's an amazing barbecue right there in Lot C. So if you get to the game early, come find me and Jared, and we'll and we'll we'll get you hooked up with the plate. Um, I, I can personally confirm. I confirm, like they they know what they're doing. UTSA fans globally, and this isn't me just kissing butt because. Y'all are on. Like, UTSA fans know what they're doing tailgating. Like, UTSA fans uh, don't tailgate like a fan base that's had a football team for a decade or so. It's yeah, because like they've been tailgating, tailgating well above their weight. Cowboys, Spurs games, long car games, whatever, for decades. Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the one recommendation I always like to give that's probably a little bit off the map, they've started to get a little notoriety nationally mm. and, and, and uh, within the state, right? Texas Monthly and stuff like that. Uh, but there's a spot called Carnitas Lonja that Oof. I think is absolutely amazing. It's the best carnitas you'll ever have. Fresh tortillas made on the spot. You got to get there kind of early. I think they did start some like dinner thing recently. I haven't checked out myself yet. Uh, but like Sunday morning before you you know head back uh, to Houston, that's definitely the spot if you can get there early. And man, just uh, carnitas like you've never had before. Uh, braised and lard uh, with fresh guacamole on top. Man, it's, it's uh, incredible. So it's highly recommended on my part. All right, speaking my language, that sounds pretty amazing. So, all right, glad we could end the uh, the interview on a positive note. You know, win or lose, uh, the good food is always something you can appreciate from uh, from making a road trip. So, appreciate you guys helping us out with all that, and uh, best of luck to you guys uh, uh, on Saturday. Appreciate it. Hope you enjoy your trip to San Antonio. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Birds up. So, UTSA is definitely an intriguing week one opponent, and even if you don't buy the Roadrunners as a seriously good team as much as I think both of us do to some extent. I think it's rare, you know, you see so many short and long-term indicators for a program pointed in such a good place for a team outside of the quote-unquote power leagues. And I think it was really impressive, you know, that they have a head coach in Jeff Trailer who is extremely connected in the Lone Star State. And beyond those connections, you know, showed the coaching chops to assemble a good staff and to show immediate results like they have the last two seasons. Just a team that has a dynamic, exciting offense. I think, you know, a defense that has 
potential. It's you know a really intriguing matchup, Dustin. One that I would say has more intrigue than I would say at least 85, 90% of the other week one matchups out there. A, a kind of matchup that I think whether fairly or not, and I would lean towards unfairly, I think is going to have outsized narrative implications for both teams and what people think they're going to do in the 2022 season. Yeah, no, I think it's a game that even if I wasn't a fan of either team, I would be having, you know, kind of circled on my, on my calendar for really interesting games that is going to, you know, set someone's season up and, and, you know, set two programs that have very high expectations heading into the year. I mean, it's two teams that won 12 games last year and, you know, someone's, Gonna gonna lose one uh, right at the gates, and Houston obviously proved that you can you can lose your first game of the season and still have a great year, still going to win twelve games. Um, but you know these are two programs that are expecting to win, and that at this point, you know are expecting to win most of their football games, and will be coming in very confident in this one. And you know just some interesting you know kind of things I gleaned from talking to uh, to the guys, uh, you know just hearing Adrian talk about the, you know the, the path forward for UTSA being kind of getting into that shootout and that is definitely I think something that's that scares me a little bit and you know watching this team last year you know I remember you know maybe based on our interview apparently I over remember the extent to which since Jim McCormick felt like such a huge part of this offense and to see them maybe really kind of switch gears and go and really let Frank Harris uh, you know sling, sling it around the yard quite a bit that is something that, that stresses me out a little bit as a uh, U of H fan knowing that you know the Cougs have some uh, some new guys, new faces in uh, the secondary, or some guys stepping into bigger roles in the secondary at least. And you know, I think it makes for a really intriguing matchup there, where you know I expect Clayton Tune and the, the Houston offense to do well. But you know, I, I think there's a not insignificant fa- uh, chance that Frank Harris is going to throw for a bunch of yards and and score enough points to uh, make this one really competitive and uh, and scary for the Cougs. Yeah, I don't think there's any one UTSA player who's been more of a face of this renaissance of roadrunner football than that super senior quarterback you just mentioned, Frank Harris. And I would say other than some bad injury luck over his career has really been quite a positive force. That team, the last two seasons accounted for 54 total touchdowns. But I think maybe the most impressive stat is, you know, only six uh, interceptions and almost 400 pass attempts last season and last season average eight yards per pass attempt uh, over the course of the year. And so it wasn't like he was, you know, throwing only six interceptions in a dink and dunk, Offense is not a running quarterback, but has been a good enough runner to have amassed over a thousand yards in those two previous seasons. You know, a, a good enough passer, though, that you're not going to even think to give him kind of a derisive label like running quarterback. And it's not just Harris in the past game. The Roadrunners have a really experienced, productive group of receivers as well. Last uh, year's top three pass catchers are back Sakari Franklin, Josh Cephas, and DeCorian Clark. Franklin had a thousand plus yards receiving and set the uh, UTSA program record for single season receptions, receiving yards and touchdowns while being named first team all conference and Cephas and Clark, no, no biggie just combined for 123 receptions and 13 scores. If Clark's name is at least somewhat familiar to you, he actually signed an LOI uh, in that December early signing period with the Apple white uh, staff in the 2019 class. But after UH made the coaching change, uh, Clark got out of his LOI and subsequently signed with UTSA and has certainly had a nice career in San Antonio ever since i think even though the co-host i or excuse me our guests the host the alamo dome audible listen to that wherever you get podcasts uh even though i think they at least somewhat downplayed sincere mccormick's departure i do think that's a big loss to them i, I do think you know a guy who was another face of this program a, a guy who came from one of san antonio's most historically successful prep powers converse judson and capped off a really great college career last season had just under 1500 yards for the season. I, I do like Traylon Smith. I think that was a really nice get. He was a good back at Arkansas, though. Probably not a bell cow running back, but I think our guest basically said that's probably going to be, be a bit more running back by committee there. And I'll toss it back to you, Dustin, but I think the matchup that actually interests me the most, I mean, obviously, UTSA's pass game versus Cougar secondary that does have a couple stars to replace is definitely an important matchup here. And certainly, I think one that gives us probably a little bit of heartburn, but I think that Cougar defensive front, Sack Avenue, against a UTSA offensive line that returns four starters, but the one star they lose is in maybe the most critical position. I think that's going to be an interesting matchup, one that potentially favors the Cougs, but certainly an impactful one, I think, on how this game goes. Yeah, hearing kind of the uncertainty uh, at who's going to fill the left tackle position and what kind of quality of play they're going to be getting from the guy. Filling the left tackle, left tackle position definitely is probably the single thing during that interview that gave me the most uh, encouragement for feeling good about 
uh, how Saturday's result might go because that, as much as like, oh man, four starters might have a good, a good line, but yeah, if your left tackle is uh, is getting beat repeatedly, then uh, that can make uh, the whole rest of the line not look uh, so good if the whole can kind of make the whole thing uh, fall apart. So we'll see how that goes. And then yeah, on the other side, you know, we've talked about before, U of H does not face a ton of uh, real good defenses on this year's schedule, and as much as UTSA was an impressive team last year, they weren't you know, a super strong uh, defensive group. And, and kind of like we talked about in the interview, losing uh, a couple of, uh, of top guys off of that group. So, you know, I'm real, you know, I feel like the, the amount of transfers they have coming in, the potential is certainly there for them to end up being maybe as good, uh, maybe slightly better defense uh, this year. But, you know, you'd hope uh, week one right out of the gates, hope maybe catch them before some of those uh, pieces have a chance to gel. But, uh, you know, this feels like a, a, a UTSA defense, Sam, that the Cougars should be, uh, you know, be able to score some points against. I'm not as high on UTSA's defense as I am the offense. I mean, whatever you want to say about the strength or lack thereof when it comes to Conference USA, I think you could put UTSA's offense out there against the majority of Division I defenses, and they would, you know, depending on the strength of the opponent, you know, do differing degrees of at least challenging all those opposing defenses, if not have a you know good game. I think that's a very good offense. I think we both are pretty well established on that. And I don't know if this is a bad defense per se, but yeah, I don't share that same level of optimism you know, about that group. They you know, had the 77th ranked defense per SP plus last year in division one. And after the you know conclusion of last season, and they had some clunkers last year, they surrendered 45 points to UNT, who was not a good offense last year, 38 in their bowl game to San Diego state. Also not a good offense, but and it's not totally analogous to the offense, but uh, you know, I'll point out that their defense also loses uh, co-defensive coordinator and defensive line coach Rod Wright, who took a position on the new Miami staff, though. Jess Lope, who was a co-DC last year, returns with the sole title. I, I think it's an interesting run defense. They were definitely better against the run last year, and they, you know, they return, uh, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Tremaine Bell, uh, Brandon Brown, who played on the nose last year, I thought what did pretty well there as a freshman, but they do lose Clarence Hicks there absolute near you know, number one pass rusher, multi-year starter, Lorenzo Dantzler. And so you know, I'm curious, Joe Evans is someone that uh, our guests mentioned specifically mammoth interior defensive lineman from LSU, but I don't know if they have an answer, certainly not week one of the season for what they're losing from Hicks as a pass, r- pass rusher. And certainly our guests didn't undersell you know, what Hicks did last year to maybe help mask some issues that the Roadrunners had in the secondary, but return both their middle linebackers are still a fair amount of good going on there on that defense. It's not a bad group, but you know, I think the unit I'm you know most curious about and you know is that Roadrunner secondary and going up against a Cougar passing attack that you know has Clayton Toon back, has Tank Dell back, has a lot of promising young guys behind Dell. And yeah, they do return Rashad Wisdom, first team all conference pick multiple years at safety, but you know, lose Tariq Woolen and even last year, you know, with Woolen, Wisdom, and a full group of people, you know, they, they had some clunkers. They allowed 300 passing yards to 300 plus, excuse me, UNLV, San Diego State, La Tech, and maybe a bit more understandable 300 plus to Memphis as well. You know, I, I'm curious whether this group that, you know, other than maybe Western Kentucky last year, hasn't paced a ton of really good pass attacks in the last year. So I'm curious how they'll do and, and how they'll do without someone like Hicks in the front, you know, maybe creating pressure and, you know, making life harder for Clayton Toon. Yeah. And in terms of UTSA and the level of competition that they're facing in Houston, that kind of brings me to my last thought on the game, which is just kind of a big picture one. You know, you heard the guys talk about it. this is in Jeff Trailer talked about it. This is, you know, maybe the, the, the best team that he's faced since he's been at UTSA. Um, and, you know, this is a Houston team that is, you know, already in what, while already in the American Athletic Conference is already a you know a bigger program than UTSA and I think comes in with more national recognition with more you know highly rated recruits on the roster that kind of thing um, but you know starting next year this is Houston when they play a team like UTSA even with UTSA moving up to the American you're still the you know the power conference team facing the non-power conference team and there are certain you know expectations that come along with that you know if UTSA wins over Houston on Saturday, it's it's theoretically it's 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 less of an upset than if they were to you know win uh, the same matchup a year from now when Houston is is in the Big Twelve. So I think it's kind of your preparation for that. And as much as this is every sports you know prep year before you head to the Big Twelve, you know if you're if you're a Big Twelve team, you you want to go out there against even a, a good team like UTSA coming off of a good season 
and you want to feel like you can can exert your will a little bit, like you can maybe bully them around a little bit, like if you're going to maybe going to be the the bigger, stronger, faster team. So I'm just I'm curious. That's kind of my last big picture thought. Is I'm curious to just to see if you get that feeling watching this game on Saturday. Does this feel like a you know program about to be in the Big Twelve versus a you know program only you know just about to be in the American and making that step? Does this look like a a UTSA program that is functionally, you know, 10 years behind Houston doing what Houston was doing, I guess, nine years ago now in, in joining uh, the Americans. So, you know, it's maybe a little bit uh, cocky. It's maybe a little bit optimistic, but I, I am hopeful that we see on Friday a Cougar team that is able to, uh, you know, looks like the uh, the bully a little bit. And Saturday as well. We're hoping to see it on, on Saturday. Saturday. What did I say? Friday. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking. I mean, they'd be early. They, they, they would be early. At least they would bossing people around on Friday and also uh, on Saturday when the football game starts. I mean, bottom line, this is a good UTSA team. And I think maybe most importantly, it's a confident team. And the name of the game so often is confidence. And I, for the first time this offseason, this was no longer a, you know, UTSA has the potential to be a top CUSA team. UTSA is a sleeping giant, et cetera, et cetera. This team now won 12 games in a conference title. And, you know, that's a big hurdle to clear for a young program. And I really hope the Cougar fans who listen to this have no false belief that this is an opponent that will in any way be a walkover in any way an easy game. I feel comfortable saying Frank Harris is one of the best three quarterbacks UH will see in the regular season. I don't know if he's number three out of that top three. And, you know, the thought of a super senior quarterback having all his top targets back to go after a Cougar secondary that just lost a couple NFL guys, that gives me a little bit of heartburn, as I think, you know, said here. And this offense, the Cougar side should have the ability to move the ball on the road runner defense, though, I think I'd feel better about this team establishing the run if we were coming in with a healthy Alton McCaskill. And, and I think we're high on this Cougar receiver group and everything we've heard of spring and fall camps has been how the staff is finally happy with the top end talent and the depth in this group. But outside of Tank Dell and Kishon Carter, most of the guys that are running out there will be playing their first game at U of H and they won't have that kind of, you know, instinctive, you know, communication and, you know, ability to, you know, work together the same way that, tune Dell and Carter might and you know I think the line in this game right now most anywhere you'd look on Monday evening as U of H is a four and a half point favorite and it hasn't moved a ton that line I think it started somewhere around five and a half six points and I think that's fair even if I'm personally not touching with the 10 foot pole and you know I I certainly expect there'll be a good number of Cougar fans who make the trip west on I-10 not to mention everyone who you know went to U of H as U of H fan who lives in that part of Texas and you know, I think there'll be a good representation for the red and white in the Alamo Dome on Saturday. But I would still also say underestimate UTSA's ability to create atmosphere at your own peril. UH is a top 25 opponent, absolutely a name opponent on the schedule. And as a somewhat more established Texas program, you're you're in that upset territory. And I don't think there'll be any doubt of motive any doubt that there'll be a lot of motivation on the UTSA side to uh to win this one and to kind of prove that that you know 12 win season last year wasn't any kind of product of uh Conference USA, just as there's a hunger on the Cougar side to prove that the Cougars' 12 uh, win season last year wasn't just a co- uh, product of the conference schedule breaking their way as well. All right. Well, I think that's everything we have to say about uh, Cougar football. Let's talk about some football games that do not involve the University of Houston and uh, at least a couple of interesting results from week zero. None of it's super germane to U of H or the conference per se, but at least as a, as a college football fan, there are a couple of results that caught my eyes. Uh, you know, certainly Nebraska losing to Northwestern and Ireland in part just because it's you know, Scott Frost uh, decided that the best time to uh, go for a surprise onside kick was when you're up by 11 and in control of the game, which was just kind of funny, I guess, uh, just kind of from a shot and fire perspective. You know, Northwestern, the only big team in Nebraska beat uh, in a one and eight Big Ten uh, campaign last year, and they opened the season uh, by losing to the uh, Northwestern in front of the entire sports uh, watching audience is really the only game in that uh, time window in the very first time window of the season. So season hasn't even started for like 90% of teams, Sam and Scott Frost is already all but fired. And that is, you know, at least a little bit funny, I guess. And throwing his, throwing his new offensive coordinator and staff under the bus. It's just like, buddy, that's, that's not going to save your job. It's only going to make uh, a potential future colleague uh, think you're an a-hole. Uh, I can't believe Dustin, you didn't lead with the week zero performance of the week. That is uh Doug Brumfield's 300 plus yard uh, Mountain West Player of the Week performance uh, against Idaho State for the UNLV run and let Rebels. But you know what? I'll I'll let that slide. That's fine. Yeah, we'll let that slide into me having uh, no comments or notes about uh, UNLV. Was it Idaho State? Idaho Idaho State. The the Bengals. That's that's fine. I'll accept it.
Excuse me. Uh, no, the only other uh, real interesting result uh, from week zero for me, North Texas easily handing UTEP, handling UTEP in the Sun Bowl 31-13. An impressive, uh, it's been an impressive run now for the Mean Green uh, dating back to last season. They've won six consecutive regular seasons uh, games, including, as we mentioned, the F for uh, the win over uh, previously unbeaten Roadrunners of UTSA last year. So, um, you know, kind of an uh, interesting uh, Lone Star State result. Yeah, and North Texas missing several key offensive players, including veteran receiver Jair Shorter. But I thought I thought Austin Ani looked really good. I think you're starting to see for the first time since Mason Fine in his four years there, North Texas starting to have some offensive identity again, which you know shouldn't be too surprising. Seth Luttrell is one of the better offensive minds out there, a guy who's you know coached many many good offenses over his career. But I don't think UT, uh, UTEP is going to be especially good this year. But UNT. Went into a sold out Sun Bowl without several key guys and won that one without really having to break too much of a sweat, which I think isn't just a statement about UTEP and their strength or lack thereof this year, but that UNT with UTEP at probably its highest ebb this season still didn't struggle to lose that one very much. I don't think last year's UNT team, which really, really needed a hot finish to the season to get to six and six, would have been able to pull out the game that we just saw this past weekend with the ease this past weekend. I'm hoping that. Uh, bodes well for UNT potentially upsetting SMU, a game that I'm sure we'll get to uh, hear a little bit later. I was going to say, we might be uh, very close from going from uh, Seth Luttrell essentially on the hot seat about to get fired to uh, Seth Luttrell maybe uh, having a a team capable of a CUSA title run. Uh, Looking at some week one games on the schedule, going to take it uh, chronologically Thursday. uh, you got the backyard brawl, Sam, really the only game that I'm too interested on Thursday. West Virginia versus Pitt. One of the really, truly hate-filled rivalries in college football. These teams haven't played in 11 years, uh, so it's just re uh, you know reigniting that rivalry. Pitt's got a top 25 team heading into this one at home. This one is going to be absolutely wild, and just as a neutral, this one feels like it's going to be just a, a lot of fun to watch on Thursday, Sam. Yeah, one of college football's most fantastic rivalries. Really happy to see it back for the first time since West Virginia left for the Big 12 following the 2011 season. It's been so long since a backyard brawl has been played, Dustin. The last time this game was played, Daniel Holgerson was a first-year head coach. That's wild. There's been a number of years that have elapsed uh, since then. One of the best of the weekend, I would say, and certainly the most interesting game on the Big 12 slate. Like you said, both teams come to the season with some intrigue. Pitt's coming off their best season in a number of years, but did lose most of the players and the OC responsible I think largely for that turnaround last year in West Virginia isn't a make or break kind of season uh, under head coach Neil Brown uh, have one time five star quarterback JT Daniels likely running in the air raid offense with Graham Harrell, which I think should be fairly exciting. But yeah, for the Thursday night games, that's about it in terms of, I would say, must see college football viewing. And then Friday, there's some games as well, but can't really make myself care too much about any of them. Temple is at Duke, where they are remarkably just a seven-point underdog. So I don't know. I guess Duke must not be uh, very up this year. If they're only a seven-point favorite over Temple at home. Uh, and then, you know, one for the future conference mates uh, up in TCU as they'll be uh, facing Colorado to open the season, Sam. Yeah, that's, I think, the only remotely palatable Friday night game for me. I think I think we're both uh, pretty sick for college football generally, so I think that's quite the statement from us. But it'll be the first time in two decades that TCU uh, starts their season with somebody not named Gary Patterson as head coach, which is kind of wild given how head coaching turnover is these days. Should be at least an offensively entertaining game. Sonny Dykes' teams are always pretty compelling offensively, played at elevation in Boulder. Should be at least halfway decent but uh not a strong friday night slate certainly across the uh, sport and then as we get into saturday the 11 a.m slate for me easy game to uh, to choose really the one that jumps out from that time window for me is uh, nc state at east carolina uh, nc state uh kind of like uh, Pitt coming into the season uh, with just a super uncharacteristic amount of hype they're number 13 in the country uh, just really picked to be one of the uh, the top teams in the ACC this year. And, you know, a dangerous thing if you're a good ACC team historically has been to travel to uh, to Dowdy Ficklin Stadium uh, to face the East Carolina Pirates on, the, Pirates on the road. And, you know, certainly ECU the last couple of years hasn't been as uh, dangerous, but certainly they have one of those teams that you feel like could be a, uh, you know, dangerous to good teams type of team, especially when they're, they're at home. And so, you know, I'm sure uh, NC State, when they scheduled this one, was maybe not hoping or not maybe either not realizing that they were going to have as good a team or would maybe uh, not wanting to be facing a a ECU team. I honestly don't know why ACC teams continue to schedule 
East Carolina I games. I think there's actually uh, some Virginia. kind of North Carolina state law about That's the teams right. playing each other every so often. I don't think it's an yeah. every year thing, but I'm pretty sure it's just in my brain somewhere. It's like, no, 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 it's state law. God, can you imagine just really quick aside if Texas had that? That would be absolutely fantastic, but will never, ever happen in any of our lifetimes. But yeah, this is ECU hosting an NC State team with their highest preseason expectations in ages. I knew that they were a top 25 team. I knew Devin Leary, their quarterback, is somebody that's getting a lot of preseason buzz. But I was surprised when I saw that they were uh, preseason number 13. And like you said, historically, going to Dowdy Ficklin as a top 25 ACC team, uh, not the best uh, indicator, though. I think the big match in this one will be whether ECU's defense, a defense that I think was a bright spot in their resurgent season last year, can deal with Devin Leary, can deal with an NC State pass game that projects to be pretty salty after losing a couple of good starters from last year's team. I don't think that helps things, but I bet Greenville and Dowdy Ficklin is going to be absolutely packed and uh, lit for uh, this in-state matchup. And then Saturday in the afternoon slot, uh, while UH is playing at 2.30, uh, Cincinnati will be at Arkansas. Big test for the Bearcats right out of the gates as they are uh, just replacing so many pieces. They're at a top 20 Arkansas team right at the gates. Vegas only has the Bearcats as a six and a half point underdog in this one, Sam. Honestly, even if they lose, if they can keep it within uh, one score, uh, I think that would be a pretty impressive result on the road against a, a good team. Would agree with that. This was one that I was mad wasn't in the earlier or later time slot. I was mad this one conflicted with U of H because that's actually what I really want to watch. I think is going to be a really interesting matchup. I don't think the Bearcats' performance in Fayetteville should be any kind of referendum on their 2022 season, but it'll definitely be a stress test for a team that will be breaking in a lot of new faces at key spots on both sides of the ball. Like you said, Arkansas is about a touchdown favorite, and I, I feel like that's kind of fair considering the Hogs are a preseason top 25 team themselves are fairly good in the home confines. So yeah, I think if you're Cincinnati and you just keep this one close, you know, no moral victories, yada, yada, yada. But I don't think it's any kind of bad sign if this is a close loss. And I think, you know, if they win this game, you almost after one week flip the narrative uh, on its head about Cincinnati, you know, losing all these guys. And they, to be clear, they've lost a ton from last year, but being, you know, incapable of potentially playing at a high level, I think this would be a great one if they can get it, but uh, if they can't, I think no black mark on Luke Fickle and uh, this coming season's Bearcats team. Also in that uh, two thirty window, Oregon is at Georgia, which yeah, 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 it's a it's a normie pick, but you know, in so much as it's even wise to care about uh, the uh, the college football playoff, it is just kind of interesting that just everybody knows that you know Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia are in a tier by themselves this year, so you know. It would be, uh, this is kind of a, an interesting early uh, test of that theory, if uh, if nothing else. You know, season to season, things change a lot, but we'll point out that Oregon, one of the more inexplicable results, I would say, the 2021 non-conference, they beat Ohio State last year. That's one of those results that I have to remind myself, oh yeah, that actually did happen. It's kind of interesting because Oregon, under their previous head coach, Mario Cristobal, and I'm assuming that's going to continue under Dan Lanning, their current head coach, and the most recently Georgia defensive coordinator before that, recruited from Florida and recruited from the Southeast, so... It's not just West Coast guys. There'll be a number of guys going up against guys they know in this one. I think more so than you might think uh, on the surface of an Oregon-Georgia matchup. Also in that afternoon window, a 3 o'clock kick between BYU and South Florida in Tampa. BYU kind of a surprisingly low 11.5 point favorite on the road as a top 25 team against a USF squad that has been pretty lousy the last couple of seasons it seems like vegas is at least uh somewhat buying the jeff scott year three boost sam and we'll i think from this one get an early indication of how far uh, the bulls have come yeah i'm curious about this one and if you'll recall usf uh, on a trip to provo last year kept that one i I think surprisingly close compared to (laughs) the pretty low expectations we had for that team going out to utah and a bulls upset here heck i would say the bulls keeping this one pretty close in tampa I wouldn't say it would completely turn around my expectations for the season if they just keep it close, but I don't know, man, if they win this, you might start, might start having to think about them differently. I mean, who knows? Maybe if they win this, it could just be kind of, you know, week one outlier result, but I'm curious about, I'm curious enough about this one, Dustin, that I turned on alerts for it uh, today as I put together my notes, which is, you know, don't think I'm going to watch this one. Don't think it's going to be one that ultimately USF wins, but I feel like there's enough of a faint hope for an upset there that I at least, want to be aware in real time if it's happening yeah i don't know I, I will have to think differently about usf if they win this one because right now what i think about them is that there's no chance they're going to win this one so i guess that would by definition make me think about them differently 
Uh, plenty of good games in the evening time slots to uh, flip around between uh, SMU at North Texas, one that jumps out for me, a uh, good test for the Mustangs. Um, and that, you know, especially that Mustang defense that we know is probably pretty suspect uh, against what we mentioned is going to be a, a UNT team that has been playing well of late, a team that has already had a game to kind of gel and get some fig- get some things figured out this year, and a, a team with a pretty good uh, quarterback in Austin Ani. Yeah. I think I still fully expect that SMU is going to win that one, but you know we t- just talked about it. North Texas comfortably beat UTEP with some key guys missing, probably got some first game jitters out of their system by playing the game on week zero. So will be an interesting one to watch, and I think it would be a statement too if SMU comes out there and just it's not close from the start, and they look every bit the awesome offense that they did uh, for the last couple seasons prior to this one. Speaking of AAC teams that I loathe playing on the road, Memphis also at 630 will be at Mississippi State. This one you may remember was totally bonkers when these teams faced off in Memphis last year with the Tigers benefiting from one of the season's most memorable blown calls to come away with a two point victory. I would have to imagine that's going to be pretty fresh in the minds of uh, Mississippi State. Uh, and, you know, and as I mentioned in our AAC preview, I'm not super high on Memphis. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I would not be surprised if this one uh, gets a little bit ugly, Sam. One of the more statistically improbable wins of the entire 2021 season, and not just because of that insane missed call on a Memphis punt return touchdown with a guy clearly called for a fair catch. But you would imagine Bulldog fans are still pretty salty about that, and that Mike Leach air raid is certainly a torture test for any secondary, much less, I would say, a Tiger defense that comes into the season somewhat unproven. I, I can't think of anything I would like less, Dustin, than to see my defense play the Mike Leach air raid straight out of the gate in week one. It's just, it's not going to be pleasant for you. Even if you expect your team's going to still win the game, it's still going to be death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. Also at six 30. And again, uh, I, well, I hate myself for mentioning it. It's a very lame normie pick, but Notre Dame at Ohio state. And, you know, won't say too much about it other than that. Yeah. I'll at least be keeping at most half an eye on it. Uh, but kind of the same thing about the Aura, Oregon Georgia game applies here of just kind of a uh, interesting early test of uh, the extent to which uh, Ohio State, Georgia, Alabama are, you know, completely on a different plane than everybody else. Yeah, even though I don't know the ins and outs of those teams super well, I'd be surprised if either Oregon or Notre Dame made either of those games respectively super competitive going into the fourth quarter. I feel like those those might be games that are like, ooh, like, you know, Oregon's the touchdown earlier. Oh, Notre Dame takes a 10-7 lead and that we fast forward ahead of the fourth quarter and that, you know, the two favorite teams are ahead by, you know, two to four touchdowns. And you're like, okay, what else is on in this time slot? <laughs> Which thankfully for uh, the evening and the uh, Ohio State Notre Dame time slot is uh, quite a lot of other options out there. Yeah, honestly, plenty else. Some other games we hadn't mentioned in that evening time slot, Utah at Florida, uh, the Utes coming into the season with a top 10 team, one of their most heralded, you know, high expectation teams in a long time. And, you know, at a place that's been traditionally uh, pretty difficult to play in the swamp, but uh, a couple of, uh, you know, uninspiring last couple of years for Florida, but getting year one of the uh, the Billy Napier era uh, started with a, a big non-conference home game means, uh, you know, this is one game that, you know, two teams with the kind of, like you said, you know, about some, uh, you know, just a lot of uh, kind of narrative implications uh, on the line in this one. At least in terms of the games that are on over air channels or cable channels, at least, excuse me. I would say this one, as the U of H game is finishing up, might be my pick for the big TV. You know, the Utes are rightfully at least slight favorites here, but, you know, going to Florida at night is never something easy, even in lean years for the Gator program. And I, I would imagine morale there is still pretty high uh and you know the for the first game of billy napier's time there all right and then yet uh, we're gonna go and throw a fifth game at you in the saturday 6 30 time slot and that is army at coastal carolina really really fun if you like the contrasting styles uh this is maybe your your ultimate example with army of course running the option going up against coastal carolina and uh you know veteran quarterback grayson mccall uh, one of the, uh, you know, I think most highly touted quarterbacks in the country. Certainly, I think when you talk about the quote unquote G5 quarterbacks, him and Clayton Toon, you know, quite, quite arguably, I think could be uh, could be one, two in that category. So in terms of a, uh, you know, team that's going to run the option versus a team that's going to chuck the ball around the yard. If you like that contrasting styles, everything that college football kind of has to offer, uh, would recommend keeping an eye on Army at uh, Coastal. Yeah, that's going to be a really fun one. Two teams, like you said, who have very good, very unique offenses. And then just criminally, this is not on a, uh, a channel you can get in any way other than uh, streaming through the ESPN app, uh, through ESPN Plus, but a really good one. Definitely worth uh, popping over to ESPN Plus for. Maybe 
I would say my favorite in that specific evening time slot. All right, Sam. And a game that I know you had at least uh, something in your notes for and really not a lot in the late night time slot. So I'm going to be an easy sell here because I can't think of anything else that I really want to watch. But Sam, sell me on Boise State, Oregon State on Saturday at 930. Whew. So I think I can actually do a decent job of this. It helps also that you, know, you have priors as a uh, college football sicko. But Boise State's coming off a atypical Boise State kind of season. I believe they won seven or eight games last year. Not the typical just blowing through the Mountain West schedule and getting, you know, a win or two or even representing the uh, the G5 and the NY6. That just wasn't that kind of uh, season in the first year of Andy Avalos. Last year, as Brian Harson left to uh, take the job at Auburn and probably age himself uh, 10 years in the process. So Boise State, you know, previously it's like, okay, you know, they play a lower level Pac-12 school. It's like, yeah, they lose that, but, you know, whatever. It's Boise. They're going to win 11 to 12 games a year. But I feel like this game has more pressure than any week one game that Boise State has played in a long while. And while Oregon State certainly isn't a household name, probably not a team you encounter uh, if you're listening in your college football watching very often, but they've quietly been quite decent, went to a bowl last year, did a real kind of steady, consistent build under uh, one of their uh, all-time great quarterbacks, Jonathan Smith, who's been there the last four years. So I think it'll be a competitive game, and I think it's a game that has a lot more I guess, pressure and you know anxiety and narrative implications for Boise. So there you go, Dustin. That's your sell job on Boise State, Oregon State, which is the best and, quite frankly, only viable option for uh, college football after 9 p.m. Central this coming Saturday. All right, Sam, well, there's one good place to end the Scott and Holman podcast. That is talking about Boise State, Oregon State football. So I think that's where we'll go ahead and call this one an episode. Very excited that the next time we talk to you guys, it'll be uh, in with some Cougar football in the rearview mirror to actually talk about. So very, very much looking forward to that. Hope to see uh, plenty of y'all uh, on Saturday in San Antonio as I will be making the trip uh, down I-10 for that game. Hope to see plenty of y'all there. Um, it should be uh, a fun one on our way out. Always want to give a huge thank you to the Scott Holman podcast, Patreon supporters who are just pretty much, you know, our, our favorite human beings on earth. Don't tell any of our significant others or family members that, but basically Sam and my favorite human beings on earth are Patreon supporters, uh, who continue to, uh, uh you know, put uh, money behind the work that Sam and I do trying to put uh, out good cougar content for y'all on a weekly basis. So if you do regularly enjoy the work that Sam and I do, and if your money's at a point in your life where you feel like you can afford a couple of bucks a month, we would love for you to go to shpodcast.com slash support. You will find a link to make a recurring monthly donation on Patreon. You can also send us a tip one time via PayPal. You can also, uh, from that link, uh, find a uh, link to our uh, store, which has got some merchandise with our street sign logo on it. We also do love hearing from you, the listener. You can email us, shpodcast at gmail.com, or you can tweet at us at shpodcast. That's the end of the road for us. Thank you so much, those of you that listened all the way to the end. And as always, go Cougs. Go Cougs. Vamos los Cougs. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. We ain't invited to the party. You had to kick the door in. No cap. 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 No cap.